Molecular orbital theory is one of the major methods for understanding the electronic structure of molecules, and we've been working our way through a series of videos on this topic. In the first video, we discuss representations and how they can be used to stand in for orbitals. In the second video, we discuss symmetry adapted linear combinations of atomic orbitals, or SALCs, along with how they can be orthogonalized and how the projection operator can be used to draw a picture of the orbital. Here, we'll put all this together to get a molecular orbital diagram for a simple system. Namely, we will take our orthogonalized salcs from the previous video and put them with the orbitals of the central nitrogen to get the molecular orbitals. As a result, we'll be discussing orbital mixing to form the MOs. Relative orbital energies, if you don't have any other information, can be estimated by the electronegativity of the atoms involved. Atoms with high electronegativity will have orbitals that are lower in energy. For ammonia, we will assume that the nitrogen orbitals will be lower in energy than the hydrogen orbitals because of nitrogen's higher electronegativity. Here are a few general principles to think about with orbital mixing. These can be derived from first principles using quantum mechanics and a little math, but that's not the point here, so I'll just list them. First, if you're mixing orbitals on either side of an MO diagram, the antibonding should go up just a little bit more than the bonding orbital goes down. Second, the closer the orbitals are in energy that you're mixing, the greater the mixing. Third, the greater the overlap, the greater the mixing, and the bigger the splitting. Let's say you're forming the MO diagram for a diatomic, AX, where X is the more electronegative atom. Both A and X have one orbital that happens to be in the same irreducible representation. When the orbitals mix, you will make bonding and antibonding orbitals. We'll label the bonding one 1A sub I because it's lower in energy than the antibonding one 2A sub I star where the star indicates that this is clearly an antibonding orbital. The energy of the bonding orbital, E sub B, will be lower than the energy of the X orbital, but because it is closer in energy to X than A, it will have more X character, we say. The energy of the antibonding orbital, E sub A, is higher in energy than the orbital on A, and it will have more A character because it's closer in energy to A. If you have a three orbital interaction with one orbital on one side and two on the other, then you can have one bond between the groups that you're looking at. In other words, the most bonds you can have is the smallest number of orbitals on one side, with that irreducible representation. One fair question to ask would be, which A sub I on X should we pick? The strength of the interaction depends on how close in energy the orbitals are on either side and how well they overlap. So we'll pick the one closer in energy to the orbital on X here. You form a bonding and antibonding interaction with two of the orbitals, but what do you do with the third? If you don't have any other information, it should come across as non-bonding. So you'll combine to make a set of bonding, non-bonding, and antibonding orbitals. In reality, all the orbitals in the same irreducible representation can mix. So 2Ai can mix with the bonding 1Ai, which will raise the energy of 1Ai and lower 2Ai. Alternatively, 2Ai could mix with the antibonding orbital, raising the energy of 2Ai and lowering 3Ai. Again, knowing which of these will happen depends on having more information about the system than just the symmetry, which is our focus here. In the end, however, regardless of the mixing, you have one bonding, one antibonding, and one non-bonding orbital. So let's look at a simple molecular orbital diagram. In the last video, we detailed how to find orthogonal salts for ammonia. In the end, the orbitals have wave functions of this type. If we use an unshaded orbital for positive and shaded for negative, we draw a picture of what these salts should look like. We'll place these salcs from the hydrogens on one side of the MO diagram. On the other side, we'll find the irreducible representations corresponding to the S and P orbitals on the central nitrogen. Since the nitrogen is more electronegative, we'll put the nitrogen S orbital a little lower than the hydrogen salcs. Whether the hydrogen S orbital is lower in energy than the P orbitals on the nitrogen will require some external information, and we'll put them about the same energy. Again, we're mostly concerned with the symmetries for this video and getting a qualitative MO diagram, so this is fine for our purposes. The start of our MO diagram looks like this. All our hydrogen salcs start with more or less the same energy because the hydrogens are non-interacting. Each hydrogen has one electron each, so we'll have a total of three on the left side. On the right, we have the five valence electrons of nitrogen. There's one pair of E orbitals on each side. Those will interact to give bonding and antibonding orbitals 1e and 2e star. Now we have a three orbital interaction. 
The S and PZ orbitals on hydrogen both have A1 symmetry, and there is one A1 salic on the left side. As a result, we can form a single A1 bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital. Without any other information, we will bring the other A1 orbital across as essentially non-bonding to start, but which A1 on the nitrogen should we use to form the bond? Let's look at each of the nitrogen orbitals overlapping with the A1 salc on the hydrogens. On the left is the PZ orbital interacting with this salc, and on the right is the S orbital. To my eye, the S would seem to give better overlap. There could even be a little antibonding character in the system on the left, depending on the H and H angle. Let's overlap the salc with the S orbital and leave the PZ as it is. A full MO diagram will look something like this. We have a total of eight electrons from both sides, so we'll fill those in to get the highest occupied molecular orbital is 2A1, which is approximately non-bonding on the nitrogen. The lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is 3A1 star, a sigma antibonding orbital. To find the number of bonds, we take the number of electrons in bonding orbitals and divide by two. There are six electrons in the 1a1 and 1e orbitals, so 6 divided by 2 equals 3 bonds total between the nitrogen and the hydrogens. MO theory, by its nature, gives these as high to localized orbitals like those shown. We can compare the orbitals we've drawn with those from an advanced computational package. Here are our by hand orbitals side by side with those calculated, showing they look very much the same, once you get used to how the phases smear out to make the lobes anyway. The lone pair on nitrogen, which likely mixes a bit with the 1A1 orbital below it, looks like this in the calculation versus our MO diagram. It certainly has a general shape of a P orbital. The MOs for ammonia make a lot of sense with regards to the Lewis structure of ammonia. The MOs are always localized relative to the Lewis structure, but there should be the same number of bonds and the same number of lone pairs. The Lewis diagram looks like this, with three bonds and one lone pair, just like the MOs. Let's look at the MO diagram for a stable but reactive compound, oxygen difluoride, OF2. The salks for the orbitals on the fluorines are relatively easy to calculate, but can also be done by inspection. There are only two fluorines, so each type of orbital, S, PZ, PX, PY, will have end phase and out of phase combination, so you can assign those to irreducible representations by looking at their symmetries. Starting with the S orbitals on the fluorines, we can make end phase and out of phase combinations like this. Then we can apply the symmetry operations in C2V to see what their symmetry is. Keep in mind the above are not a basis. These are each one orbital. The one on the left, where they are in phase, we'll call it gamma Sn. This orbital is obviously invariant with respect to all the symmetry in C2V, so it is in the totally symmetric representation A1. The orbital on the right is symmetric with respect to the E and sigma V Y Z, but is anti-symmetric with respect to C2 and sigma V X Z. As a result, it is in the B2 irreducible representation. So we have this for the S orbitals on the fluorines of OF2. The P orbitals on fluorine can be done similarly and look like this. If you think about the symmetry operations and compare those to the characters in the irreducible rep, you should be able to confirm that these have these symmetries. We have the salcs for the orbitals on the fluorines away from the central atom. We find the oxygen orbital symmetries by simply looking at the character table, then both sides of our MO diagram can be set up. The orbitals on the fluorines, since it's more electronegative, will be somewhat lower in energy. There are lots of orbital interactions to look at here, and quite a few MOs. We can start with the five orbital interaction for A1. There are two orbitals of A1 symmetry on oxygen, S and PZ, and there are three salcs with that symmetry, so two sets of bonding, antibonding pairs will be generated and a non-bonding orbital. You have to decide which orbitals will be involved in the bonding, mostly based on the symmetry and the overlap. The orbital labeled 3A1 is called non-bonding. In the end, it can mix with the other A1 orbitals, but it looks like a good candidate to call the majority of the non-bonding orbital as being due to this salc. Next, there is an A2 salc with no match on oxygen, so it will be strictly non-bonding, and we'll add it to the MOs. There's a relatively simple two-orbital interaction with B1, so let's add those bonding and antibonding orbitals. Finally, there are three salcs of B2 chemistry, but only one orbital on oxygen that is B2. As a result, we can form one bonding, antibonding pair, and the other two salcs will be non-bonding. That gives us the full MO picture. All that is left is to add the correct number of valence electrons. The fluorines have seven electrons each, and oxygen has six. 
so a total of 20 electrons in her valence MO picture. I said earlier that the number of bonds and lone pairs in the MO should match the Lewis diagram. Lewis diagram has two bonds and eight lone pairs. Our MO diagram has four filled bonding orbitals, 1A1, 1B2, 1B1, and 2A1. Then there are four non-bonding orbitals that are filled, 2B2, A2, 3B2, and 3A1. Finally, there are two filled antibonding orbitals, 4A1 star and 2B1 star. With four bonding and two antibonding orbitals filled, then there are two net bonds in the molecule, just like in the MO diagram. What about the lone pairs? We have four filled non-bonding orbitals, so those could be interpreted as lone pairs, albeit delocalized. However, there should be eight lone pairs. Well, if you have bonding antibonding pairs that are filled, they aren't bonding electrons any longer. They are essentially non-bonding electrons. So we have four orbitals with pairs of electrons that are filled bonding antibonding pairs that are essentially delocalized lone pairs in MO theory. We get to eight lone pairs, eight pairs of non-bonding electrons with four filled non-bonding orbitals, two filled bonding orbitals, and two filled antibonding orbitals. As a result, we have a good match between our Lewis diagram and the MOs. We have two bonds in each case, and we have eight non-bonding pairs of electrons. As expected in the MO cases, all of those orbitals are delocalized. In this short video, we focused on building qualitative MO diagrams from SALX. As a result, we were pretty much just using the symmetry of the system and estimating orbital energies to find what the MOs might look like, which can generally get you pretty close to calculated pictures for simple systems. If you enjoyed this video and want to support future videos covering topics like this one, please subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. We make these videos for fun and as a way of interacting with and giving back to the community, so we greatly appreciate your support. Thanks.